In this video, I'm going to be reviewing and setting up the Big Tree Tech Clipper Pad 7. This is a new product, which makes it really easy to get started with Clipper for 3D printers. But what is Clipper? Well, I made this handy diagram to explain everything because it is kind of confusing when you first come into it. All right, let's get started. All right, so Clipper is a way of inter interfacing with 3D printers. Now, in the past, you would have a slicing program. It would generate G-code, and then you would stream that G-code to your printer. The printer itself, the firmware, would have usually something called Marlin on it, which is a type of firmware, that would interpret the G-code and then do all the math and then move the motors around to print the stuff. Uh, the problem is older printers, they only had 8-bit uh, MCUs, so they couldn't do math very well. Also, they were slow and they might not be optimized. So what Clipper does is it puts like a generic firmware on all the printers with base configurations. And then all of the heavy math is done in a Linux box. So let's set this up here. Okay, so first of all, you have a Linux box. And the Linux box has usually at least three elements on it. It has the Clipper software. So this is like... They call it the Clipper firmware, but I don't like calling it that because firmware should be like on a microcontroller. So the Clipper software, this is what actually does all the math. So the G code comes into it. This does all the math and the movement calculations. And then it sends very low level commands over the USB bus or however you connect to your printer to an existing 3D printer motherboard. Now this motherboard does need to be reflashed with new code to make it work with Clipper. But once it is flashed with this new code, it basically becomes like a kind of a dumb terminal where it takes low level commands from Clipper and drives motors basically, and also reads the sensors. And it's pretty remarkable because in my tests, like you can, not only can you get, you can get a lot more speed out of these old printers, but the, the motors in my test stayed cool as a cucumber, which is pretty hard to believe considering how fast they were going. So there's a lot of uh, magic juice going on here. Okay, so if we dial it back a bit, so the Clipper software interfaces with a Moonraker API server, which basically exposes the Clipper software functions to other programs such as Mainsail, which is the one that comes with the Clipper pad. Mainsail is a web UI that allows you to interface with everything in Clipper. That's where you drag and drop your G code files to. That's where you do your configuration settings. There's other interfaces such as Fluid. You can also use Octoprint, but all of those interfaces will interact with Moonraker, which will then interact with Clipper. So then you access Mainsail uh, with a web browser or the Clipper pad in this case. And there's actually another element called Clipper Screen, which runs the screen. But yeah, let's just say it's a web browser. So the web browser or an app on your phone will talk to Mainsail. And that's the best way for you to interface with it. Uh, you also do some of the setup with SSH commands into the Linux system. But once you get started, you don't need to worry about that at all. So then you have your favorite slicing program. So this program will create G-code like it always does, although you'll probably have different starting and ending scripts, and you can probably also go a little faster. So you generate the G-code, then use the web browser to stick it into main sale, and then main sale sends it down the road to the Clipper software, which then tells the Clipper firmware on your printer how to print. So the Clipper pad has everything that's in the Linux box portion already set up. So we just need to set up the printer configuration within that. Now, something you can also do, and you can do it with the Clipper pad as well, you can actually install multiple instances of Clipper, but you actually have to have entirely new instances. So you need another Clipper software, another Moonraker, and another Mainsail or Octoprint or Fluid. Uh, we're just going to do a single one in this test, although based off the... Uh, Processor loads that I saw while testing, I think you could probably easily get at least four of them onto one pad. All right, with that all that set up out of the way, let's get started. I've talked about this several times, but I might as well talk about it again. The main thing I use 3D printers for these days are making parts for the accessibility controllers that I build for people with disabilities. Specifically, you got your shaft here, cap here, uh, new D-pad there in the center, so it can be hit by either side extra A, B, X, Y buttons, and of course, the trigger on the back. So yeah, I, uh, I print parts for this all the time. I still print these uh, black TPU uh, buttons on the old MakerBot. But yeah, that's what I spend most of my time 3D printing. And uh, I think it was 2020? Yeah, I want to say it was like September of 2020. We were doing a Zoom call because we were... Uh, for MGC, the Midwest Gaming Classic, we were doing Zoom calls because the show was canceled, of course. And that was like in September, and someone was like, I remember because I just 
just gotten Bud the kitten. And someone was like, hey, Ben, there's a printer on uh, Amazon for $150, which back then was really cheap. And I think it was that Anycubic Zero or whatever. So I bought it because I thought it'd be fun to like check out a printer that cheap. Then I made a video and then since then Anycubic is like, oh, you made a video about our printer. So they keep sending me printers to uh, evaluate. And then it just kind of goes from there. So then recently I had Big Tree Tech send me a clipper pad to evaluate. So that just came in today. So I thought we would take a look at it. I actually uh, hung out with the uh, Big Tree Tech people at their booth at Murph. They were all very nice people. And actually their CEO was there. And it was his first time ever visiting the United States because he's from China. And he was a really nice guy. I I wasn't able to really communicate with him, but he showed me a lot of cool pictures from his factory. So they've actually come quite a long ways. So Big Tree Tech, I don't think I ever made a video about it, but they basically make uh, driver boards for 3D printers. So if you want to like upgrade your older 3D printer, you can put in a Big Tree Tech board. Uh, they usually have like a SKR series. I started like a, with 1.3. Then they went up to two, and I think they're up to three now, and they actually gave me one of those as well to evaluate, which I was looking into. But they also have products for Clipper. So Clipper is the new hotness that I learned all about at Murph. Basically the idea is, it's kind of like Octoprint, except for you're doing all of the heavy calculations on your host computer, like your Linux box, your Raspberry Pi or whatever. Then you create new firmware, or Clipper compiles new firmware, which goes onto your 3D printer, and your 3D printer becomes basically like a dumb stepper driver. Um, which is good, because if you have an older 3D printer with an 8-bit CPU, it's not going to do math very well, it's not going to have floating point at all. Actually, a lot of them don't have floating point. So anyway, one of the issues, though, is... You know, oh, we're going to put Clipper on a Raspberry Pi, but you can't get Raspberry Pi. So one of the better solutions is to actually buy a Big Tree Tech Pad 7. There's other pads, but this is the one made by uh, Big Tree Tech. So this acts as your host. So you don't have to try to find an unobtainium Raspberry Pi. And this whole solution doesn't cost too much more than what you have to scalp a Pi for these days. So yeah, let's do an unboxing and uh, see if we can get this set up. I was going to replace the electronics in my Maker Gear M2. I was thinking about bumping that up to an SKR 3. However, I do have... Uh, do I have any other 8-bit printers here? All right. Is this... What is this? Just a super quick start guide? Oh, it's got like a, a stand. CB1. I believe what they did was they made something the same form factor as one of the new Raspberry Pi compute modules that you can't find. So if you want, you can actually swap in a Raspberry Pi compute module in 2027. So basically this is a big Raspberry Pi with a screen on it. I assume it's already pre-installed with Clipper. Oh boy, more stickers. Oh, I should put these on my uh, Big Tree Tech printer. Actually, they have their own brand of printer now. It's called a BQ. Oh, I don't have to worry about that coming loose in the shipping. Oh, hmm, okay. Oh, it's got a, oh, it's got a CAN bus. Oh, one of the pins is slightly broken. Yeah, apparently CAN bus is also the new hotness. Like, these printers will put... They'll, they'll use USB-C to drive a CAN bus, because it's just two differential signals. And then they'll use the power of the USB-C to actually power the elements. Yeah. Spy, that's probably for an input shaper. SD card, this probably holds the OS. Oh, there's quite a few ports on it. I guess you would put this in front of a printer, or multiple printers. Oh, there's the duck. <laughs> I'm going to critique other countries' plugs. Australia plug, super cool. UK plug, super dumb. Europe. It looks like something from like a 1940s toaster. And then, America plug not as cool as Australia plug. I think I think China actually uses the UK one. Don't quote me on that. Leave a comment below.
I would say commenting helps the algorithm, but all of those Indiana Jones videos I made destroy the algorithm. So, never mind. Oh, this is an uh, input shaper head. Come on, get out of the box. Get out of the bag. Yeah, yeah, this is an accelerometer that you hook up to your head. And so it goes... And then the accelerometer um, senses the shake. And then it can store that data and then do a profile. So much like bed leveling, the printer can compensate for the resonance of the printer. We have to put the America plug on it. America plug. F yeah. Coming again to plug in things now. Kind of weird you think that would plug into the side of it. I wonder if there's anything on it. Let's see. Big Tree Tech Activate. Ah, oh, this is really difficult to film. <laughs> Generic Big Tree Tech blah 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 config does not exist. Oh, I suppose we have to put it in there. Is this booting off of the SD card? Does this do anything? Oh, wait a second. Let me, uh, let me take a photo of this air even though I've also recording it on the on the camera. Is it redundancy or laziness? Leave a comment below. Oh, stereo speakers, look at that. You could play some music on this. Oh yeah, look, slice time correction, so if it's inaccurate, you could tweak the inaccuracy. Very scientific. Um, screen, it's not the greatest screen. Oh, I just turned it off. <laughs> now the screen doesn't work at all. Uh, yeah, the screen's okay. Great, I'm going to have to reboot. That was not graceful. I stuck the SD card in my laptop. It has a Linux uh, boot system on it. it. Looks like it's an all winter chip this thing is running off of. It's not too much of a surprise considering it comes from China. It's a pretty popular uh, ARM chip over there. Anyway, yeah, I guess I'm going to have... Well, it said go into home, so I guess I'm going to have to get into the Linux system on this. Um, I guess all the instructions are online, so I guess I'm going to have to go online and read the instructions and then continue from there. I've connected to my network. I looked it up online. Apparently I have to use the web interface to set up a printer configuration file so this thing will at least uh, bootstrap itself. Here's the web interface. Same message. It needs a config file. I went online. Actually, I just went to the Clipper GitHub and I found one for Maker Gear M2, because I was thinking about upgrading my Maker Gear M2. Really, I just want to add a BL Touch. I thought about putting that SKR3 in it, but maybe I could just use this. This way, I wouldn't have to rewire anything. I mean, I might have to wire up the BL Touch. I guess I could try it. I mean, worst case scenario, I have to reflash it. <laughs> I think it's got the original firmware from 2016 in it anyway. All right, so that's a config file. So I saved it, just the file itself. So let's see, upload file. Oh, this will do it right over the, uh, oh yeah, do it, <laughs> I don't even need to putty into this. I can just do it this way. Okay, upload of printer config file successful. So apparently the front of it, like printer dash, that a prefix means that this is a known like mainstream printer. Yeah, let's see, uh, restart firmware, restart. Well, I don't have the firmware yet. Let's just restart this. Okay, so printer config. Oh, that's, okay, I see. Include main cell config. Okay, that's probably important. Get the impression this is gonna be a pound sign? Yeah. Okay, so. Include my config file. Oh, cool. Okay, we got the Clipper, at least the host version, working. And now we got to connect it to the printer, which means I have to figure out how to flash the printer. I think those printers, well, it's more or less an Arduino, so it should have a bootloader on it. So you should be able to update the firmware over the USB cable. Config files, root config, config examples. Well, wait, here's all, yeah, this is the same thing I saw on GitHub. Like. I could have just grabbed that Maker Gear file right here. Can I move it? What can I do with it? I can download it. Oh, so what? I would download it to this computer and then re-upload it back into uh, config. Oh, look, this one won't let you upload. This is like a static directory. See, these icons changed. 
That's weird. So I was looking at it uh, through Windows Terminal. So Clipper, LS. So if you go into config here, you see all the samples. Uh, yeah, so this config folder in Linux is actually the config examples folder in the web interface, which is kind of weird. Yeah, and you can see docs is there. That one matches what's here. Well, anyway, uh, through this interface, you can also do the, uh, uh, you can compile the, the firmware that actually goes onto your printer. So you go make menu config. Of course, I had to look this up. I don't know how any of this works. So yeah, we're going to say low level stuff, microcontroller architecture, AVR, processor model 2560, AKA the, uh, what was that called? The Arduino Mega? Yes. Uh, 16 megahertz would be correct. UART zero would be correct. That goes into a converter chip, USB to UART converter chip. Baud rate for serial port. Uh, I want to say it's like 115, 200 right now. Hmm. I should probably double check that. So this must basically be like a really low level microcontroller configurator. And then every, all the magic happens with the config file that we loaded earlier. Yeah. Hmm. Huh. Okay. Well, let's say that's what we want. Good. Yeah. CD out. So I've already done this. Clipper.elf.hex. That would be the thing to use. Is AVR dude on this system? It is. So yes, if we hook the printer up to this, we should be able to flash... We should be able to flash it with this clipper pad over USB. Okay, change of plans with the 3D printer clipper project. A buddy of mine was coming to hang out this weekend, and he's the one that I gave that Anycubic Mega Zero to, the one that I did a review on like in 2020, the $150 printer. And I was like, hey, do you, do you still have that thing? He's like, yeah, I never really did much with it. And I'm like, could you bring it back? So I'm like, this is the perfect example for clipper. Like, this is like, but I'm trying to do a video. This is like the weakest printer I have here. It's got a 80 mega 128 8 board. So it's a definitely an 8-bit beast. Because we should be able to put new firmware on this using the clipper pad. Okay, so that is the uh, Anycubic Mega Zero. It actually has one of those ancient uh, a USB to serial adapter chips. So it's very old school. So this would be what we put into clipper all right so actually i have the uh yeah i'm gonna go ahead and upload i found a configuration file for a clipper for this printer so i'm gonna go ahead and upload that yeah let's see upload no upload file all right big tree tech blah 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 dig the d elves dug too greedily and too deep there we go mz config so i should be able to go over here just add an include. Happy little clouds. MZ config. Okay, that should in the MZ config file. We need to find the MCU. All right, so we have to take what we found in Linux. Copy that. Oh, it looks like yeah. See how it's got a similar name, but it's going to have a different ID. So. Make sure that's the right one. One A six IF zero zero port zero. Okay, cool. Nice. So let's save and close. Back over here, Bud jumped onto my chair. Go back to the user directory. Uh, Clipper. Uh, let's see. What was that? Uh, make clean. Clean up that. Make menu config, I think it was. Yeah, there we go. Okay, board architecture is going to be Jank Mustank. And it's a, oh, it says right here in the config file, AVR at 80 mega, 1284p. Great. All right, so get that 16 megahertz. Uh, yeah, I think, yeah, it would be 16. It's a bog standard at Mel. UART zero, yeah, that's only baud rate for serial port. Well, this would be after I flash it. 
because this would be a separate procedure than, uh, yeah. So that would be the new baud rate, I assume. I think this should all be right. You know, this is the first time I've ever done this. So I'm just going to do bog standard AVR 1284P. All right. So let's see. Everything's good. Q, save configuration, make. Then I found this page here, which talks about how to do the bootloader commands. Uh, they already have AVR dude on this clipper pad, so I should be able to just use this command because there should be a bootloader on there already. Uh, well, or would there be? I guess we'll find out. I think it does have a bootloader. I was doing some research. Uh, yeah, so we shouldn't have to reprogram the bootloader. We should just be able to use the bootloader to reprogram the application area. I have no idea if this is going to work or not. Clipper, flipper, no, clipper.elf. Oh, I think I had the wrong command. Come on. Can't open device. Wait, it's talking about TTY AMA0? That's weird. I wonder why that would work. That seems kind of generic. Wait, that time it worked? I just typed in this. Okay, I must have reset it. So if I go over to the screen, it should be dead. Uh, no, not entirely. Okay, all right, so let's put the rest of this in here. See, this part, I mean, it, this varies by every printer, so. Although the thing I keep seeing with a clipper, it's like, well, this isn't, this isn't, it's not necessarily that, like, meant to be, like, the super easy, straightforward thing. Okay, so port zero, baud rate, and then D flash out clipper. Oh, wait, I think we're already in the, in that folder, so. Watch Ben fumble around in Linux. How much fun could you ever want out of a video? Oh, darn it. <laughs> That's the one with the AMA0. Oh, come on. All right. Serial device. Blah, 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 blah. No such file. Or to... oh. <laughs> How about that? Come on. Oh, there we go. It's writing. Sweet. <laughs> nice. Now it's verifying. Cool. All right, so let's go back to the root. <clears throat> There's no S command, I can't believe it. All right. Actually, yeah, that wouldn't change because there's a convert there's a USB to serial converter chip that's talking to the Atmel chip because that type of uh, MCU does not have dedicated USB. So therefore, this is the name of the converter chip, not actually the Atmel chip. Let's go save and close. Okay, so let's go to printer config. Let's comment that back in. Save and close. Let's do firmware restart. Uh, oh, is it connected? Did it work? Is it secret? Is it safe? 20 Celsius. How much? What? Alexa, what is 20 degrees Celsius in America units? 68 degrees in my basement. That sounds correct. All right. Well, in theory, the. Oh, yeah, the, the clipper pad updated as well. So um, this web interface is fun and all, but let's actually go over to the machine. Look, it updated this screen as well. Does it actually do anything? Oh, it does! <laughs> That's awesome! The clipper firmware that goes on the microcontroller is generic. It's because it's based off the microcontroller, not the printer. How does it know to make this screen work? Okay, that part's cool. That's impressive because it just worked. But the real thing is obviously the clipper pad right here. Part fan. See, this is the thing. I, I think I might have plugged this in, the, in wrong. Well, actually, the part fan would be in the one on the side. Oh, yeah, that worked. I guess this fan just runs all the time. Okay, so I guess I must have hooked the part fan up correctly. All right, let's see what else we got. Um, go back, move, Y, X. Okay, let's try to go up in the Z axis. 
Let's go 10 millimeters. Must home first, okay. Hey, bud, it's working. It's working. End stop Z still triggered after retract. Oh crap! <laughs> I had to. I have to. I have to fix that. Yeah, the little uh, blade connector was breaking, and I had to solder it to fix it. So they don't really have a very good strain relief on that. Let's try that again. Cool. All right, so let's go. Let's go 50. 50 up. Riveting content. Uh, okay, it should have the Cartesian dimensions of this printer should have been in the config file. So let's see if it'll go past the edge. Yep, it won't let me. That's cool. I don't know. <laughs> Once I found the right command for AVR, dude, it worked perfectly fine. Uh, yeah, so I assume there would be a folder. What's this? Oh, these must be macros. Oh, you, you probably can define your own macros, I assume. Oh, there's a whole bunch of them. Right, what's this? Oh, that's probably... Oh, that was probably e-stop. <laughs> can you use it to change the filament? Let's see. Extruder. Oh, there we go. Oh, I heard the... F <laughs> My gosh, I don't know if you could... The fan decreased in speed because this thing only has a 12-volt power supply, so... <laughs> the, the, the extruder made the fan slow down a little bit. <laughs> the uh, configuration file that I found off the internet, it had a section which specified what kind of LCD is on the machine, so that's how that worked. It wasn't magic after all. Did that filament get all mucked up? Oh, it's all dried out. Oh yeah, so me and my friend, we actually updated the Mega Zero to a Big Tree Tech uh, motherboard, uh, I don't know, like winter of 2020. But I actually took that out and put the original crappy board back in to lobotomize it to make it the most, the most, uh, basically, yeah, to make it really old, make it a, good, a good candidate for this. They actually do have uh, uh, clipper profiles for the, See, Big Tree Tech made a drop-in replacement board for the AnyCubic Mega Zero. It was like specifically designed for that printer, and that's like a 32-bit processor. But yeah, I, I wanted the old 8-bit one. Yeah, I was looking at the settings here. Like this thing is like really slow. Like 190 seems kind of low for a PLA, but it's probably because there's only a 12-volt uh, motor in it. But yes, print speed 40 millimeters a second. So let's do this. I'm going to just print something small. And I'll, I, I should be able to up, upload the G-code from Kira into the Clipper web interface. G-code files. I wonder if I could just click and drag. Now, oh, that was pretty obvious. Oh, okay, so then do I just print this then? Is that how this works? Oh, there's the files right there. All right, now let's see what happens. Oh, yes, let's do it. This is my first try. Uh, three or four days ago, I spent a few hours one night like researching all of this kind of like after I unboxed the pad and before I did this, obviously. And uh, well, you know what? I shouldn't say it was easy until I actually see it printing something. So I'm not going to say that quite yet. Uh, there's no heated bed on this printer. So once it hits 190, you're going to see some serious stuff. Yeah, there's a little bit of stuff on the print head from when I was purging it. Remember kids, always stick your hands into machinery. That's what the cool people do. Oh man, that is printing a huge... Is that a skirt? What is that? It's like skirt layers, 500. Oh, it defaults to brim. So it's printing a huge brim. I think there might be some extruder issues with this printer, uh, like with the hot end. Uh, that's nothing that we can change in uh, Clipper. While that prints at an excruciatingly slow 40 millimeters a second, here's a cat. 
I gotta love this really redundant screen over here. <laughs> but I like how they make everything in really big font so it's easier to read. Because remember, like, you might, you might not have a clipper pad. You might have clipper installed on a Raspberry Pi. So this probably would be the only screen you'd see at the printer. I am hearing some crunchies with the extruder. Oh, it looks like this part's not put on fully. But it appears to be printing properly. 81%. So, of course, the next thing I'm going to do is bump it up to... Oh, I don't know. Let's try 150. Hmm, that's weird. For some reason, they said the part is canceled. Okay. Now, can I do Z or do I have to home that too? No, I have to home everything. Okay. So, some weirdness at the end, but it did work. Okay, so this is going to be a 150 test. Even though it's much faster in millimeters per second, the print time only went down to six minutes from eight minutes before. Probably because the part is so small, it probably can't get up to speed too much. Like if you're printing like a big cube or something, you'd probably see a bigger uh, change in speed, uh, print time. Oh yeah, that's definitely a difference. <laughs> Bud, your new nickname is a goo goober who drives for Uber. That is your new name. What do you think about that? So my original intention was to update this Maker Gear M2. This is the 2016 model. This one has a, uh, I think it's either Ramps or Rambo board, which is based off the uh, AT Mega 2560. Again, it's an older 8-bit processor. It's got a lot of flash storage, but yeah, it's older. Uh, but yeah, this is a really solid printer. I just feel like it's held back by its CPU. The BL Touch Probe. See, normally this printer uh, Z's at the bottom. So it actually goes down here, hits a switch, and then it goes like negative like 180 millimeters back up to the print head, which seems kind of backwards. And also like the leveling procedure is really obtuse in this printer. So I'm gonna see if I can hook the BL Touch up to some extra pins on the uh, ramps board. And then in theory, you should be able to define what pins you hooked up the BL Touch to in the Clipper configuration file and then add the BL Touch to your exi existing board. We opened up the box, I never looked at it before actually. It's a Rambo board. So I've got a BL Touch that I added. So I uh, adjusted these DuPont connectors so I can hook this up to where it's supposed to go on the system. The BL Touch has a connector. It's basically like a little servo plus a switch. So I connected the switch portion into the Z min port. This printer actually uses a Max Z. So I'll just leave that plugged in for now. And uh, yeah, so I think it's pin 44 in the Arduino mapping or PL5 in the CPU mapping. That should be all I need. Okay, I made a backup of both the flash and the EEPROM. All right, I've got the Rambo board plugged into Clipper. Here is its path. Right. So let's see, where's MCU setting? Oh, there it is. Dev serial by ID and then that. All right, let's save that. Let's see, AVR. Okay, processor model, 2560. What are the extra options? Uh, those extra options look pretty standard. Should be good. Quit, save configuration, and make. Okay, AVR dude, C wiring, AT Mega 25. 60. Uh, oh, we're already in this folder, so we don't need that. I got this from the Clipper documentation. Let's see if it works. Oh, there it is. It's writing. So, again, it had a bootloader. What the? Bud, what are you doing? Did Isaac Newton discover gravity or did cats? Okay, it should be updated. Okay, so in theory, I should be able to go into printer config. 
and let's get rid of that. Let's we're gonna have different macros. So let's do this. That's the config file we want to use. Save and close. Firmware restart. Okay, it says it's awake. All right. Let's see if it worked. After about an hour of messing around with this BL Touch, I thought it was broken. So I grabbed an old bent one out of a box, same issue, then I realized it's these neodymium magnets I'm using for the quick release. So you have this all done. This is all done up in a magnetic quick release that I, re I redesigned the extruder on this. Yeah, so <laughs> if it's a little bit further away, turn it off, turn it on. That's what it's supposed to do. Yeah, but if you get a little bit too close, yeah. That neodymium magnet right there is messing it up. <sighs> I guess I could, I'd have to, oh gosh, I'll have to reprint the part, take this apart. <laughs> well, then it's kind of bumping into these, into these cables here. See, I already made something to move all that cabling to the right. See that little linkage in there? That's what that's for. Ah, <sighs> shoot. I didn't think attaching a BL touch to this would be like taking the ring to Mount Doom. Yeah, so I've got to take this apart now. So the filament's going through that. So I actually have to hope this will heat up so I can remove the filament. Uh, the temperatures look valid for a basement. And uh, where's it here? Actions. Extrude. Temperature. PLA. Fans are kicking on. That's a good sign. Oh, cool, the correct fan turned on, so, yeah, that's the, uh, that's the stepper fan, and this is the part cooling fan. All right, will it work? Macro, un oh, no, I don't have a filament. I don't have a, ma I don't know, I don't have a macro. There it goes. You can never have enough ASCII charts. I just open this up and rip it out. There, done. Yeah, so... Okay, let's turn that off. Yeah, this guy. Let's see? Yeah, it's kind of convenient for cle clearing a filament jam, but I never really had a problem with it. So let's combine this into one piece. Yeah, this was the design file for the new and improved extruder that I designed in Fusion 360. Yeah, so th there's a separate magnet mounted piece for the filament guide. That's in case the filament uh, gets stuck. And it's uh, never really happened. So there's no reason that this piece couldn't just be connected to this piece behind it. So I think I'll make copies of both and then I'll just do a fused version, a fused fusion version. That way I can just omit these magnets and keep the magnetic field away from the BL touch. There's still some magnets up here, but they shouldn't affect it there. Magnets, how do those even work? So I'm gonna take uh, this and I'm gonna do a combine and the tool body is going to be this. And we're going to combine them. Don't keep the tools. All right, cool. Now that's one solid part. It's one of those like stupid problems to find. You know, and you're kind of glad when you find them, but then it's like, ah, oh, it's so obvious. What, bud, do you, do you think you have an idea of how to fix this? I mean, do you know what all these wires and compositions and alloys are? You're just a goo goober who drives for Uber. I'm printing the new part on the Creality K1. It's a, still a pretty solid printer. I've been using it for a few things here and there. Uh, it does still have like some line layer issues. Usually when something changes, actually I got a better example of that. I designed this and printed it with Hyper PLA. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it seems to happen like where, you know, you have, you have these long sections where it's fine, but then when things start to change, that's when you you got a few line issues. So yeah, I'm still not exactly sure what causes that. Pretty cool, huh? Oh, and there's a magnet on each one. Okay, it's printed. Yeah, my main issue with that Creality K1 is, yeah, sometimes you'll see like line layer artifacts, like right there. I think it's triggered by that hole. 
the filament guide hole. Yeah, I, I mean, other than that, it's a really solid printer, but I don't know, maybe there's some sort of software thing that would fix that. Oh no, one of the one of the screw holes was covered up by the uh, formerly removable filament guide. Ah, three screws is enough. You don't know, you don't need more. You're gonna never gonna need more than 640k of RAM. Yeah, it's like having big honking arms on these printers. And you have like a lot of force grabbing the filament. And you can just do this and quickly remove the filament. Just release it all and just rip it right out. Yeah. This goes like that. <laughs> Now I'm probably jinxing myself by not testing this first. Oh, I'm quite sure that was the problem. I mean, what else would it be? Ha 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 ha
this should allow us to go past the limit. Okay, send probe calibrate. Nope, not that. Probe calibrate. All right, let's go. Negative one, negative two, three, four, five. All right, let's get our thing in there. Go one more, I think. And I'm still out of range. Oh, it's Z negative 1.432. Okay, so I've got to go further. Negative 1, negative 1, negative 1, negative 1, negative 1. Okay, we're at negative 1 millimeter. Oh, I can feel the friction now. That feels pretty good. All right, I'm going to go ahead and accept it. I think we also have to, uh, oh yeah, save config, config command. So save config. Oh no, it's a conflict? Well, we can just write down the number 3.475 millimeters. What, do I have to go into this file? Erase the value. Save and close. Don't restart. Go back to dashboard. And do save config again. Yep. <laughs> okay, so since there was a value there, I didn't like that I tried to save over it. The one thing I noticed that was a little weird, like the uh, the Z positioning looked like it was not quite right. Yeah, let's see, where does this thing think it's at in space? Does this screen tell us? Where are we at in space, screen? It doesn't, actually, the clipper pad doesn't show us the XY position. Okay. All right, I may be an American, but there's no way that's 125 millimeters. So there must be something wrong with the... Um, <clears throat> there must be something wrong with the Z diffuser! <laughs> uh, yeah, I think there must be something wrong with the scaling for the uh, lead screw, the Z lead screw. Yeah, this uh, rotation distance number was incorrect. They said it was 8, but it's actually 3.175. Who told me this? Dun, 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 dun. Chat GPT FTW. I double checked it with a metric ruler. That's right. Americans have metric rulers. You'll never stop us now. Let me see how well I do on this one. Oh, yeah, you know, we're going to get some America units up there and uh, see how she chooches. Let's go to 25, 23 to 25. Looks pretty good. Yeah, because, uh, yeah, the, I, I'm going to have to recalibrate that Z offset now. Look at this. I mean, why don't people love AI? Look at this. Scale that. Change it to MM per complete revolution. It's great. <laughs> as long as you don't attach machine guns to it, you should be okay. Oh, well, obviously I have to try to print something with this. How fast did this thing go before? 120? I don't think it actually went that fast. I think Marlin firmware limited it to like more like 80 so let's go save as new and we're going to call this maker gear 24 volt v2 hot end blah 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 what's it called clipper yeah clipper all right all right now we have make sure we have the old one still okay cool uh, get rid of all the ending and starting scripts where's notepad plus plus when you need it let's see so we're modified right so let's go back over to speed and yeah, let's go up Let's go 150, update profile. All right, so we're going to just uh, omit starting and ending scripts, even though we'll have that same issue where it stops right on the print, which is kind of lame, but I just want to make sure it works. So uh, let's see, repair to print. Five minutes. Okay, this is going to be at 150 millimeters a second. So I'm going to copy this over and we'll see what happens. I am starting to smell the special sauce with Clipper. The fact that you can flash the firmware once and then do all of the configurations with this web interface. All right, I wonder if this will work. What's the worst that could happen? Oh, I could break the glass. That's the worst that could happen. Oh, here we go, 215 Celsius. Are we gonna churn or burn? Some oozing going on. 
Again, this is going to do like a, yeah, it's just going to go, <laughs> as you can see. Oh, see, it's having some first layer adhesion. Oh, there it goes. Yeah, I may need to adjust that Z. This is the first time I ever attached a BL Touch to this printer. I've been wanting to put a BL Touch on this printer for years. You know, that probably wasn't even an adhesion issue. It was just a uh, not primed nozzle issue. What this printer used to do, it would go over here, and it would do a nice purge off the side, which would then hang off the side. So I'll just program that in. I also noticed when it was doing the uh, homing to the left on the X axis, it was going a little too far because this fan was bumping into this over here. So, uh, yeah, but okay, so 90% <laughs> of the time was dialing in the BL Touch, which had nothing to do with the clipper. It was because of a magnet that I had in my design. Uh, but other than that, it's been pretty straightforward. And, you know, just because I'm anal retentive, I kept a backup. <laughs> I, got, I, got, I did a flash read of what was on this Rambo board because I don't think I've ever updated the firmware on this. And I bought this thing in 2016. Here's a print at 150 millimeters a second. It looks really good. I just have to make sure the ending script works. The Z is actually probably maybe not squished quite enough. But uh, yeah, let's try 200. 200 millimeters a second. And then it uh, then it moves back to zero, zero. And the tool head was really close to that clamp over there. And I'm like, that's not 15 millimeters. I may be an American, but I can imagine 15 millimeters. I've made that joke a couple times, haven't I? This next part took me quite a while to figure out. I spent most of Saturday afternoon fiddling around with this. So and that is the start and end macros. So let's go into printer config. So uh, these are the things you have to include, like main sail. Uh, you talk about what the, the board is. It's the CB1, which is their, again, it's Big Tree Text version of the Raspberry Pi. And then I've also set up the accelerometer, which I'm going to show you in a little bit here and the probe points for the residence tester, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, down here, uh, Ben Macros. So if we go back to Ben Macros. Okay, so these are the macros that I created for this printer. See how it says, uh, so it's G code macro space start print, G code colon, and then everything's indented. So this is very, uh, well, I think it actually does go through Python. So this is all very Python. See how the context changes based off of the indent? So you actually want to indent this stuff. Okay, so I'm using Simplify 3D. So in the starting script, you do start underscore print, that's the name of your macro, bed underscore temp equals, and this part here in the curlies, this is what actually is specified to Simplify 3D. It might be different for other slicers such as Cura. Uh, you, can, you can find it online, although sometimes the information might vary. So for this one, it's material bed temperature layer zero, Extruder temp equals material print temperature layer zero. And I also added clip height equals six because I've got those little red clips on the end of mine. Aha! I don't even need to zoom in in editing. That'll save me like one second. I actually had chat GPT help me with this as well. So these are parameters that we're creating and these match what are being passed in from the starting script macro in Simplify 3D. And yes. Well, actually, I'm sorry. Th these are the local parameters, and then params dot bed temp. These are the parameters coming from Simplify. So we're gonna set those, and then G9. Oh, first we home G28. G90 is absolute coordinates, and then the first thing we do is we well after we home, we raise the Z to be the height of the clips times two. And I was basically doing that just to like torture Chat GTP and making it write all this code for me. And it did a pretty good job, except for this part I had to tweak a little bit. Then it's going to go just off the edge of the table. So the table's 200 millimeters wide. It goes just off the edge and kind of brings it forward. And then it goes down just above the table. That's this command right here. So I do that again so it doesn't hit the clips. So it goes above the clips, moves off the table, then goes down. Then it does an extruder purge. Then it wipes the extruder on the edge, lifts it up, and then... Everything starts, your, your main print starts. So the problem I had, something I had issues with here was I was setting the, the temperature, uh, the hot end and bed commands here manually, like what is it, like M190 and M104. But I was having trouble with it. It kept like, it would heat up, but then as soon as the print started, the hot ends would, would turn off. It was so confusing. So the best way to do it, I found, was to just bring this stuff in here and 
it's weird though. There, I don't know if these match some other macros or something, but this passes in the correct values because if you don't pass in the correct values, the defaults are used. So I tested it by passing in 59 and like 215. All right, so then in Simplify 3D, ending script is just end print. Turns everything off. Then it does a relative move to clear the part. So it goes Z up 10. So the reason you want relative versus absolute, because if you say Z10, it's going to go to 10 millimeters above the bed. But if you switch to relative mode and then go Z10, it's going to move 10 millimeters up from where it currently is. So that's why we go relative, move, absolute. And then we bring the table forward and put it on the bottom so that when it hits the bottom, it'll go on the rest thing that I'm about to build and then it won't you know, fall down via gravity. And then here's something else that I took a while to dig around. Um, if you hit pause or cancel print in, uh, in mainsail, it will use a built-in macro that's obfuscated. But if you want to replace it, you say G-code macro pause, rename existing base pause. So I guess that's the one that's built in. And then you say, okay, what do we want to do? And then we have all these default parameters and we're not passing any parameters in. So this is going to use the default. Because another thing that was happening, if I hit pause, the printer would go back to like the rear left corner, but I'm like, oh my gosh, it's going to hit one of the clips. Okay, home X, home Y. Oh, the thing that kind of tipped me off to the Z being off was um, when it does the Z probe thing, it, it actually first moves the Z to a safe distance, like a safe hop distance. And then it, uh, then it moves back to zero, zero. And the tool head was really close to that clamp over there. And I'm like, that's not 15 millimeters. I may be an American, but I can imagine 15 millimeters. I've made that joke a couple times, haven't I? I'm printing a mount for this thing, but oh my gosh, look at it. It's going super fast. This is at 300. I hope I don't make anything release magic smoke. Measurements look accurate. idea is that the platform will rest on this instead of the Z max end stop. Right there. 208. Cool, it worked. Okay, input shaping. So the P Pad 7 came with this board. It's got an 80XL 345 accelerometer on it. It shows the positions the X, Y, and Z, so Z plus. So X positive on this printer is this way, Y positive is, is that way. So I need to mount this like that. And then I'll have to invert the Z, even though, well, it doesn't sense Z. And also I have to do this twice because this is a bed slinger. 3D printed a custom mount for the X axes. I'll probably just like tape it to the bed for the Y axes. Here's a problem I ran into with the uh, input shaper. So if you look at the documentation on Big Tree Tech, like their manual, it'll say, oh, you've got to set up, you know, what the MCU is and what the accelerometer is and the bus that it's on and the X, Y and Z. See how I have, I have Z negative since it's upside down. However, the thing they left it out, they left out is you also have to define the resonance tester. Now see how I've got two of them, X and Y. Now if I had a core XY printer where the head moved in the XY and the bed only went up and down, you would just say XL chip. But in this case, you actually have to define both of them because then if you do uh, auto calibrate axis X or auto calibrate axis Y, it won't work because you haven't defined these as X and Y. And you also have to put the probe point, which is the position on the bed at which it will do the shaking. So I've got it on the bed center. Obligatory, I really like Big Tree Tech products. I've used them on many occasions. However, their own documentation is usually pretty sparse and you should expect to spend a lot of time on the internet making sure you understand how everything works. And for whatever reason, Every time I search for Clipper stuff, I always ended up on Reddit. Ugh. Okay, I'm gonna go Shaper Calibrate Axis X. Oh, there it goes, it's testing the frequencies. I've left a spool of filament attached to the printer because, you know, in reality, the printer's gonna have to deal with that. And you know, that spool of filament would cause the inertia to change. I thought this was gonna be a lot more violent. Oh, it's increasing the frequency. 
It's gonna like make the Earth crack into like Nikola Tesla. Okay, yeah, because if it finds the resonant frequency of the printer, then it can offset the, offset that with its movements, kind of like noise canceling headphones. Did it stop at 133 hertz? I guess it did. There's no way we can drill into the core of the Earth. But what if we could? So for the y-axis, I just taped it to the bed. What the heck? Here we go again. Let's take a look at the input shaping blocks. So this was the before times. Yeah, you can see some of the ghosts. Well, I, I can see it. It's not too bad. But yeah, there's kind of like echoes that go in that direction. Um, I don't really see them on the left-hand side. And some on the x-axis, not as much. So the input shaping, the x-axis frequency was like uh, 75 hertz, and then the y-axis was much lower. It was like 23 hertz, probably because it's much heavier. So this is after input shaping. Actually, let's see, where was... Now th this extrusion has other issues. I think the extrusion value is incorrect. Um, well, we saw that the, um, the z-axis was incorrect. Actually, yeah, you can see a reduction, like, so, yeah. Hi, I'm Billy Mays. And you can see what happens when you use OxyClean. I, I, I hope you can see it. I can see it in, in my human eye, the difference. Oh, yeah, you can see it here, too. Again, it's still, it's still in the post one, but it's more pre prevalent in the pre one. So, yeah, input shaping appears to have made a difference. Now I just need to double check the uh, extrusion. But again, since it's a clipper, once I figure out the math, I can just type in a number and then hit firmware reset. So that's the killer app, I think. As someone who's done Marlin configurations before, the killer app is that you don't have to reflash the firmware, you can just do the clipper. Master Splitter, I lost the scythe! Then 3D print another one. I checked the Marlin configuration file for the Maker Gear, and I adjusted the min and max positions a little bit. Also, I'm, I'm still pretty sure this is over extruding. So this is a rotation distance of 31.174 millimeters. It's taking the gear ratio into account, so we sh shouldn't have to worry about that in the math. So we take 31.174 divided by pi, that gives us a diameter of 9.9 .9 millimeters. That's way too small for a maker gear. Uh, according, I checked online, it says 10.8 millimeters, but I just measured mine. And I also double checked my design files. My, the outer diameter of my toothed gear is 12 millimeters. So if we want to get really pedantic, we can take the filament, divide by two, find the center point, plus 12 gives us an actual the center point of rotation of 12.875 diameter. So we're, we're imagining that the center of the filament is actually the outside of the gear because that's actually what is being rotated. We multiply that by pi and we get a fairly different number, 40 point blah, 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 blah. So let's go in here and uh, let's put that number in, in its place. Yeah, let's do it down to... Yeah, well, that would explain the over extrusion because it's basically assuming it's a uh, nine millimeter diameter when it's actually 12. So it's kind of like when you have a tire on your car that's the wrong size and your speedometer is off. Same deal. So let's try it again at 40.448 and I'll print some parts that are meant to mesh with other parts that I've printed on other printers and we'll see if they're more accurate. Okay, this is with the new settings. This red piece was printed on the Maker Gear. This was printed on another printer. I tried one of these before and it was kind of tight. So let's see if this is any better. Definitely fits better. There's a little bit of a little bit of a lump. Oh, that might be that piece of plastic there. Let's try this gray one here. And there's still something pressuring it there. I wonder what that is. Let's compare that to this one. Yeah, that one fits a little tighter. What is it, whiny kitten? Oh, are you a whiny kitten? Meow? 
I'm going to mark these even though the difference is pretty obvious. One, two. So this is before I adjusted it. Yeah, look at these tines here. Now, see, I just say tines on purpose now. See the di difference between that and that? Yeah, so before I adjusted the extrusion, it definitely was thicker. So I think we're closer. I think the Z might need a little adjustment yet. Because I think it's extruding the right amount. Because see, it was over extruding before. That's why this is thicker than this. I'm going to double check the Z math just to make sure it's correct. And then as a uh, baseline, I just printed this on the Bamboo X1 that I'm reviewing. So, you know, that thing is like top, top flight. Also a perfect fit the dark gray. So yeah, I think something's still a little bit off. I printed a little tower here to check the layers. Looks pretty good. The corners are a little iffy. I think I probably need to adjust some more settings for that. Yeah, it looks like this corner, that's probably where it was doing the layer change. Probably need to adjust the time per layer. The gaps that we saw in the uh, ringing prints or the ringing tests appear to be gone. So I think that's probably enough dialing in for this video. I'm sure I'll continue to dial it in. It looks like I've got my first layer Z maybe a little too squished. I was having some trouble with the parts not quite sticking, so I adjusted the Z probe offset again. Flashing the firmware, assuming you have a printer that's a known printer, that part was pretty easy. The dialing in was, was the hard part. Uh, one final uh, note, in a prior video I did like a random teardown video and someone in the comments uh, told me what this is. This is called an atomic pie. So I, lo I looked it up some more and yeah there are resources for flashing this. Appear apparently there was like some sort of like smart home robot that never would, never came to market and a bunch of these have been built for that robot. So I believe there was a Kickstarter to buy these boards from the inventory and then rename them or repackage them as the Atomic Pi. Because it's, like, it's like a 64-bit Intel Atom quad core. Yeah, I mean, you can tell it was not actually made for hobbyists because this is where the power comes in. Normally, there'd be a barrel jack. The reason I bring this up is because if you had some sort of like x86 a single board computer like this laying around, you could use this to install Clipper. You could even use like an old laptop to install Clipper. It doesn't have to be a Raspberry Pi or even a Clipper pad even though this video is about the Clipper pad. Point being, like, yeah, you can install you can install Clipper on any anything you can install Linux on. So it doesn't have to necessarily be an unobtainium Raspberry Pi. But the nice thing about the Clipper pad is it is obtainium. The price is pretty reasonable and it includes a screen and all the hardware is already built in. So, you know, you don't just have this thing stuck on the wall. You got the nice Clipper pad. So yeah, and then I think, I, I believe it's, you can usually have about four instances of Clipper on a system, so that would be cool because you could have the one pad and then it could be connected like multiple printers. That way you're not having to get one pad per printer. So yeah, uh, Clipper pad, it worked out pretty well. Um, the Clipper installation itself, well, Clipper was already installed, so really it was just about setting up the printer and then dialing it, it, dialing it in. So yeah, the pad does all that for you. And of course, if you want to add anything in the future like Octoprint or uh, Fluid, you can just do that with standard Linux commands. So yeah, uh, I would recommend it. It worked out pretty well. And now I finally understand what Clipper is all about, and I hope you do too.